So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Al Sahawi. Today, I'll be speaking about Neutron. Uh, before I do that, I'll start first by telling you where I work and what we do. Uh, I work for SharkNet, which is a multi university consortia in Canada for high performance computing. We mainly are concerned the core business is high performance computing. I'm also part of the national team for uh, Compute Canada, which is in charge of cloud operations across Canada. So, we deploy lots of clouds for both HPC and for uh, public and private clouds. We have the largest cloud deployment for us is 7,000 cores. It sits in Victoria, BC, and its, its name is Arabutas, and it's located in Victoria, as I just mentioned. Why are we having this session? So the first time I attended the OpenStack Summit, I had lots of uh, sessions, but I was looking for a session that actually tells me how Neutron operates. Uh, Neutron is a big beast. We all know that. It's a core component for OpenStack. You cannot have a functional OpenStack deployment without Neutron. You could choose to ignore Cinder, Heat, or Solometer, but you cannot ignore Neutron. It's very hard to follow component as it sits. There is lots of pieces that form Neutron. There is L3 agent, ML2 agent, DHCP agent, Neutron server, um, metadata agent, and so on. And there is lots of Linux native technologies involved in to make it happen. You have to know tab devices, you have to know VE pairs, Linux bridge, open vSwitch, network namespaces. So there is lots of technology that you have to understand before understanding Neutron and its operations. And understanding is definitely key to troubleshooting. You have to understand all of that. Otherwise, any problem happens, there's no way you can fix it or you can even find where it sits. So before we start, I'll first explain five main Linux native technologies that are used by Neutron, which are tab devices, VE pairs, Linux bridge, open vSwitch, and network namespaces. A tab device software-only interface. Basically, it's a virtual interface. You attach it to user space program, and then you start sending Ethernet frames to it. It's basically used by KVM if using this hypervisor, such that you could have connectivity to your VMs. A VE pair is two, a pair of two virtual NIC cards attached to each other using a virtual wire. They're usually used to connect multiple different network entities, uh, such as open vSwitch or network namespaces or uh, Linux bridges. Linux Bridge is a virtual switch in Linux. It's, I think, the oldest one uh, in Linux. It, you can add physical and virtual interfaces to it. It operates at layer two. And if you're like me and you forget what layer two and layer three are, layer two is MAC addresses, layer three is IPs, layer four is where TCP and UDP sit. OpenV switch is a more complicated Linux bridge, more compl Linux switch per se, and it can, you can add physical and virtual interfaces to it. Uh, the big advantage it has that you can apply open flow rules on it, which is this one. Open flow rules can manipulate traffic at layer two in the switch itself. So it doesn't have to act as basically forwarding to traffic only. It can actually have some intelligence on that as well. Network namespaces are the last concept I want to explain now, which is uh, network namespaces are isolated network stacks in Linux. You could think of it of different installations of Linux from the network perspective. You could add different interfaces to them. You could add uh, different IP tables rules and different routes. So they are definitely totally isolated from the other network stacks on the same host. This is very big advantage for having network namespaces for OpenStack because OpenStack, you have your users, they create their own networks, they set their IPs. So you want them totally isolated. And this is the way that OpenStack uses to, to implement routers and DHCP. So Neutron use it for implement DHCP agent and layer three agent as well. So since now we understand the basic Linux devices or Linux native technology that explain how Neutron operate, now let's look at what does Neutron actually do. Neutron allows users to create networks and routers. It provides an API such that you could request those kind of services, such as creating routers and networks, and it manages database on the back end. It routes layer three traffic for your VMs. It provides a floating IP such that you could assign floating IPs for your VMs. It switches the layer to traffic, which is a MAC addresses traffic. Uh, it provides DHCP for instance, such that you could uh, have an instance startup and have a, VM atta a DHCP attached to it. It provides metadata your instance, such that you could inject your keys, for example, in it. And if you want to map what parts of Neutron do what, it will be basically like that. Neutron server is in charge of handling the API and the database. There's no traffic that flows through it for the VMs. L3 agent allows you to have the layer three traffic routed for the VMs and allows also you to have floating IPs attached to your VMs. ML2 agent 
it does a switching for the layer 2 traffic. DHCP agent it controls the DHCP process such that your VMs can have a DHCP address. A metadata agent is what allows you to inject um, keys and other metadata into your instances. So if we look at Neutron in a very primitive diagram, Neutron server would look like that, an API and handling a database. ML2 agent would be looking at um, a service that relies on Linux Bridge and OVS, which is Open vSwitch, and VXLAN or GRE tunnels, depending on what you choose. And L3 agent will be relying on network namespaces to operate. It relies on IP tables and rules. It relies on routing tables. And DHCP agent will rely on network namespace and DNS mask. I understand there is lots of um, ways to deploy OpenStack. In Neutron, you could use Linux Bridge totally. You can just ignore Open vSwitch. However, the most common deployment methodology for OpenStack, which is back, pack stack use as well, is using Open vSwitch for the integration and tunneling bridges. So since now we understand the functionality of pieces of Neutron, what do they do, and what Linux native technology do they rely on, let's have a look on how the VM looks when you deploy something, um, deploy VM in OpenStack. So when you create a VM in OpenStack, you would first have a VM up there with a virtual NIC card inside it. It generates traffic. Traffic goes down there to a tab device, which we explained previously. A tab device, as you could see, is the first point of entry and exit from the VM. So it's the best place to apply any kind of security group rules on top of it. So basically, uh, OpenStack uses IP tables rules on top of the tab device, which you see in here, such that it can, can implement your security group rules uh, for this particular VM. Uh, as you see, like tab device connected to a QBR, which is a Linux bridge. Those naming conventions are identical in every OpenStack deployment, so they won't change. The only difference is that you will find UUIDs or unique IDs after each one of them. But you'll find QBR in every deployment that you have uh, security groups implemented in. So QBR is a Linux bridge. Basically, it connects QVB, uh, tab device and the QVB, QVO, VETH pair. So QVB and QVO are VETH pair. They are basically a virtual wire. You send traffic from here, it goes down here. The next step after the filtered traffic gets from the QVO interface, which is the one on the bottom, you'll find it goes through the integration bridge. The integration bridge is the open vSwitch bridge. It's a VLAN tagged, so there is VLAN IDs specified in it. Traffic gets VLAN tagged in here, and if it's destined to stay in the host, this is the exit point for it. This is the end point for it. There's no further step. So if you're sending a unicast traffic for another VM on the same host, it will end in here. Um, the next step, if the traffic is destined outside the host, it will have to go through the patch interfaces in here, which is this kind of connection. And those are basically patch interfaces in, inside Open vSwitch. And then goes the tunneling bridge. From the name of tunneling bridge, tunneling bridge is responsible for sending traffic over tunnels to the rest of the compute hosts and network nodes you have in the environment. Uh, depending on the kind of uh, tunneling you use, you could use GRE or VXLAN. It creates a mesh network of tunnels between this compute host and every compute host and network host in the environment. So this is basically a recap of what I just said. VM1 has a VNIC. IP tables rules are applied to tab, tab devices to reflect the security groups. QBR is a Linux bridge. It connects the tab and QVB. QVO and QVB, QVB and QVO are VETH pair. The integration and the tunneling bridges are open vSwitches, and they're connected via a patch interface. So this is the logical way of how it looks like. But physically, we all know how to use command lines. So if you want to see this reflected in the command line, you would go, let's say this part, VM1, having a tap interface attached to it. You do PS-EF on a compute node, and you'll find the QEMU, KVM, depending on the hypervisor for sure. And there's a net dash net dev tab device, a file descriptor, and the MAC addresses for it. If we go to the next portion of it, which is the tab device connected to the QBR, you can use BRCTL show, which will allow you to see that there's a QBR bridge. You see in here this one. And there's a UUID after it. It has two interfaces, the QVB and the tab interface. If you go a bit further just to verify that the IP tables rules are applied properly to the tab interface to reflect the security groups, you will find IP tables L and grep for the tab interface name. There is a particular security group uh, chain created for this, um, for this use. So basically, the traffic is filtered at the TAP interface using the IP tables rules. This is basically a recap of what I just said. So if we go a bit further, we want to see the OVS parts, the BR int and the BR tunnel. If we do OVS VSTL show, we'll find that there is a BR int in the bottom. There's a patch connection, patch tunnel, which is basically this 
part, which connects it to the next bridge, and there is a QVO portion, and there is a tag associated with it. The tag is basically the VLAN ID that I just mentioned earlier, and this is the purpose of this bridge, that it VLAN tags the traffic and makes it possible to communicate with the VMs on the same host. And there is a BR tunnel. As you could see, there's a patch int, which is the other side of this connection, and you could also see the port for the VXLAN connection. As I mentioned, the BR tunnel will create a mesh of networks, a mesh of tunnels between this host and the rest of the host in the environment. So now we understand how a VM looks like in, in, in OpenStack physically and logically. If we proceed further and look how the traffic flows through OpenStack, there's what I could think of as five different wa ways of traffic flow in OpenStack. Basically, an instance trying to communicate with another instance while the same network. They can either live on the same host or on different hosts. Instance trying to reach another instance on different networks. Instance trying to get a DHCP address. Instance trying to reach the public network, basically the internet or any other public network you, you can have for your, um, for your deployment. Or you trying to reach the instance over a floating IP, basically SSHing there. We'll take the first scenario, an instance trying to reach another instance on the same network and the same host. So in this case, we were lucky enough that both our instances lived on the same host and they live on the same network. One notation to mention here that OpenStack, you connect your VMs to subnets. So I'm assuming here that the same network and same subnet, because normally when you change subnets, you have to go through routing. So in this case, we'll see that VM1 and VM2 live in the same host. VM1 will generate traffic. Traffic would go to the TAP interface, get security group rules applied on top of it. QBR will take it down to QVB. QVB sends QVO, goes down, gets VLAN tagged in here, and then go with the other way around. I'm only talking here about unicast traffic because there is also broadcast traffic that happens for every uh, kind of communication, like ARP requests. So you would have to get the MAC address. So it's, it's only unicast that go through this path. So let's take an example. We have VM test and test two. Uh, IP is 10.0.0.5, 10.0.0.9. They live on the same host. If we look at the same uh, scenario, and we focus on the physical implementation of it. So we look on the host and do BRCTL show. We'll find two bridges created. Each one of them has two interfaces, the tab and the QVB. And we, if we look at the definition for the integration bridge, we'll find these QVO interfaces with the same VLAN tag. So basically, this is the way that traffic flows from one instance to another. It will go down the way to here and then flow this way, as long as they know the MAC addresses for each other. So the same VLAN ID, traffic flows normally. So this was the same host. So sometimes we're unlucky that our VMs would flow or be on different hosts. So in this case, traffic has to go through a different layer, which is in here, the overlay network. So traffic would flow, in this case, from this VM, which you could see the test VM, going down to tap interface, gets its security rules applied, goes to QVB, QVO interface. This time it has to exit the host. So it will go through the patch interface, and from there it goes through the overlay network. Now you have to remember that the compute host one does not know where the other, the VM2, which is the test two, exists. So it will have to send to every host you have in your environment, telling them you have this MAC address, take this traffic for it. So traffic will go again up the patch interface, and it go up the QVO, QVB connection, go through the TAP interface, and from there it goes to the test to VM. Uh, one thing you could think about the overlay network in here as a, a big highway that actually connects maybe two cities, in this case two compute hosts, and it has lots of lanes in it. So the way that OpenStack does it is that every traffic that goes in here for a certain network, it gets its own unique lane. It doesn't go through a, a big pipe. It actually segregates it through tunnel IDs. I'll explain this in, in a sec. So the two questions we have in here is the first one, as I just mentioned, how does traffic from different tenant networks get isolated? You have an OpenStack deployment, has 100 users, everyone is creating their own network, and traffic flows through the same highway, which is the VXLAN tunnel. How do you segregate it from each other? You do this using v VXLAN tunnel IDs. So basically, BR tunnel is actually intelligent. It will map a VLAN ID on the same host to VXLAN tunnel IDs, and it makes a VXLAN tunnel ID unique per network. So this is a way it segregates traffic for a network for user A and user B. 
The other thing is, isn't it useless to send the traffic all over the place? Because what I mentioned, that traffic will be sent everywhere for every host because compute host one does not know where compute host two VMs exist. So it, it will just have to send it everywhere until it finds the VM it's looking for. And actually it is, it is very useless. So what BR tunnel here happens, it, it learns. The first time it sends, second time it gets a packet back from this VM, it will add something to its flow rules to tell that, v, that VM lives on this host, so next time I'll only send it to this host instead of the mesh of the networks. It, it's very economical to think of it this way because if you have 100 VMs in your, in your, or 100 compute hosts in your deployment and you want to do a ping, you have to do it 100 times if this doesn't exist. So let's take an example, VM test and test two. The, the IPs are mentioned and uh, they are live on different hosts. This time VM test would send the traffic down there and go with till it reach the QVO. So let's look at the QVO definition. We'll do the OVS VSTTL show. You could see that there's a tunneling bridge, there's an integration bridge, and they have the QVO interface and tag equals one. But now we know that in this scenario, the traffic will have to exit the host because VM2 does not exist on the same host or test2 does not exist on the same host. So let's look at the BR tunnel open flow rules. In this case, we'll do OVS, OFCTL dump flows and grep for the VLANs. So we'll see that there's some sort of translation that happens in here, which as I mentioned earlier, traffic goes down in here and then gets VLAN tag stripped in, at this bridge and then gets sent over a dedicated lane in the tunnel um, that's created with the other hosts. So as you could see up here, you could see that DL VLAN equals one, action equals strip the VLAN ID, put it on this tunnel ID, which is 0x39. So basically it maps everything that's coming from tagged, um, tagged interface tag equals one into 0x39 uh, tunnel. So basically it, it makes sure that traffic coming from a single network gets its own lane over the tunnel that gets created with the rest of the compute hosts or the network nodes as well. So, and the same goes the other way around. If anything is arriving on the dedicated lane, which is tunnel ID 0x39, it gets VLAN tagged with tag equals one. So it, now it can find its way to the QVO interface. So the idea is VI LAN ID is removed outbound, tunnel ID is set equal to the hexadecimal 39, VLAN ID is added inbound if the tunnel ID is coming from is 39. Compute host 2 will follow the same scenario. We focus on this part, OVS VCS CTL show, you'll find there's integration tunneling bridge, the port, the QVO has a tag ID equals two. You could notice now that although they are the same network, they actually had different VLAN IDs on different hosts. So the VLAN ID is only significant for the same host. If you have multiple VMs on the same host, they will on the same network, they will have the same VLAN ID. If they are different hosts, it can, can be different. We focus also on the uh, dump flows for this particular bridge, the BR tunnel. We'll find out that it do, does the same thing. That traffic coming is also sent through the 0x39 uh, tunnel ID. So basically it makes sure that the two hosts are communicating over the same lane when it comes to the bigger highway, which is the VXLAN. So VLAN ID is removed outbound because VLAN ID is totally significant only for the same host. Tunnel ID is set equal hexadecimal 0x39, VLAN ID to added inbound if tunnel ID 0x39. So now we've spoken about the first scenario, which is two different uh, instances, same host um, and different hosts on the same network. How about if we have different networks? The core is we have, definitely have a router because they do different networks. And networks here I mean subnets because I'm assuming single subnet per networks. So it, it actually looks more, this is how it looks like in the logical way, but more logical and more depth, in depth way, it looks like that. You'll have the traffic flow from the VM1 down here to the BR tunnel. It goes to the network node, then it gets up here to the router namespace on the network node. Then it goes down again through the tunneling bridge. It goes here to the, to the uh, tunneling bridge of the second compute host, and then goes up to reach the VM. So the idea is that tunnels are created between the compute host, the network node. Network node takes the traffic, routes it to the actual uh, compute host. If we look deeper into the network node, we'll find that it has the same assembly for the integration bridge and the tunneling bridge, such that it can tunnel to the rest of the environment. We'll see also it has the BREX, which is basically, what, you, you could choose whatever name you have for the external bridge. You could have multiples of them if you want to. This is your entry point to public uh, network. 
This Q DHCP namespace, which is basically created for every DHCP enabled subnet you have in your environment, such that you could provide DHCP addresses for your instances. There is also Q router namespace created for every router that you have with multiple interfaces in it, the QRs and the QG. QRs are connected to every subnet you connect to your router is, and QG is the default gateway for the uh, router. So if, if we look at the network node, uh, the router is implemented using L3 agent. It's implemented inside network namespaces, Q router dash, whatever ID they specify for it. There's multiple network interfaces on top of it. QR, which is specified for each network subnet you attach to your uh, router. And there's routing tables uh, that specify how the traffic flows between the interfaces. And there is one gateway interface, which is QG in this case. So if you go in the network node and do IP net and S, you will find that there is actually a Q router namespace. This one that you can go into and see uh, in more depth how it looks like. And now we'll take another example to in a sense different network and different hosts. So we have here two VMs, as you could see up here, and there is two networks that they are connected to. There's a router in between them, and the router is connected to a gateway. Um, since this router is connected to two different networks, it will have two QR interfaces. And since there are two DHCP-enabled subnets, in this case we have QDHCP with QDHCP namespace for every um, one of them, with a tap interface inside it. As you could see, there is a router up here which connects them. So the IPs are 10.0.0.16, if people can see it in the back, and 192.168.3.3 for this one. And they're both connected to a router, which has also a gateway uh, connection to the public network. So if you look at the Q router namespace, you can also easily go on any of the network nodes and do IP net exec, Q router bash. So you go inside it. This way you do an if config, you'll find the QR interfaces and the QG interfaces that you want. So each one of them has specified IP for it, and each one has a MAC address is specified as well for it. So we could say that the traffic flows between these depending on the routing table that exists inside this namespace. You have to remember this namespace is totally isolated from other namespaces in the, in the network node. So traffic flow through without, without seeing traffic from other networks or other routers in the deployment. So if you see here uh, in the network node, we do route dash n on inside the uh, namespace, you'll find that there is a destination uh, network in here. It goes through this QR interface. This destination network goes through this QR interface. And our default gateway is a QG. Basically, our, our gateway is the public network. So we could say that the router has three interfaces, two QR interfaces, one QG interface, and those are the IPs specified with it. So back to our example, we have compute host one has this VM with this IP on top of it. And if you want VM1 to communicate with VM2, which is a different network, it has to go through the router in this case. So let's have a look at the definition of the integration bridge in here. We'll find that the integration bridge has a QVO interface with certain tag for it. But we know, again, that the traffic will have to exit the host because it's destined for something outside the host. So if we do OVS, OFCTL dump flows, you'll find that there's actually a certain specified rule for the gateway for this particular VM. So as you could see, there is a MAC addresses in here is actually matching the, this interface on the router, on the network node. So actually, any traffic that gets down going to the gateway of this um, node, it will be shoved over the 0x43 uh, tunnel ID and sent over its own dedicated lane in the tunnels, uh, VXLAN tunnels. The same goes with the second compute host too. You'll find that if there's a QVO definition, there's a VLAN ID specified for the QVO uh, in the uh, OVS VCTL show. We also look again at the um, OVS OFCTL dump flows for the tunneling bridge. We'll find that the destination also for the gateway also goes through a specific tunnel ID. So the idea is that every host would communicate through its own dedicated tunnel with the network node. The network node would take it, put it in the Q router namespace, and then we'll move the traffic in between the connect connections or the interfaces such that they reach each other. So in the network node, if we go back, we know that VM1, we're getting traffic on 0x43 um, or hexadecimal 43 um, tunnel, and we're getting on 39 hexadecimal from VM2. So if we do definition for the BR integration bridge, we'll find two interfaces, the QR interfaces. Those are the ones that represent the connection to the subnets connected to the router. And then we will find that each one of them is tagged differently, which is what we expect because they are connected to different networks. As I mentioned, VLAN ID are significant on the same host 
so they have to be unique pair subnet connected. So if we do route-n inside this uh, router namespace, we'll find that there is uh, this interface connected to this network, this interface to this network. And if we look now at the tunneling bridge, the tunneling bridge should be doing the reverse of what the computer host did. It will take anything coming on the dedicated lane, move it up to the right VLAN ID, such that it moves correctly to correct interface. So if we do in here, we'll, we'll see that there's translation actually happening. Anything coming on in tunnel ID 0x43, you will see it, it's getting VLAN tagged with, tunnel, with VLAN 3. So basically, it's going to this interface, which is this interface. So it's going to correct network. The same goes with the other one, that the VLAN ID gets set to 2. And in this case, traffic gets the correct interface. The routing happens inside the Q router namespace through that the traffic will flow from a certain um, compute host to the right interface, and from the other compute host to the right interface, and traffic will ha happen to be routed inside these. So general route, uh, notes on the queue router. Uh, there's one QR interface per network, summit attached. The default gateway is QG. Network namespaces make it totally isolated, so whenever you create a router, it's totally isolated from the other routers in the environment. Instance can be on the same or different host. So whenever you have a change in subnet, traffic has to flow through a router. There's, uh, there is no special circumstances if they live in the same host or a different host. There's change in network, so there is definitely a router impl uh, involved in that. This one, I'll mention it really fast. So Innocent's trying to get a DHCP address. We focus this time at DNS mask uh, and the DQ DHCP namespace. It's created for every subnet that you have DHCP enabled on. So in this case, let's say the same example, two VMs, uh, two networks. So as you could see in here, each one of them will have its own QDHCP namespace and a tab device connected to this network. And if we do ps-ef and grab for DNS on the network node, you'll find two DNS mask processes. Each one of them has a certain tap interface it's listening on. So, and if you do IP net NS on the um, network node, you'll find the QDHCP namespaces created here for every one of them gets a QDHCP namespace. So the idea is to implement a DHCP. You have to have a DHCP namespace. You have to have a DNS mask process running. And you have to have a way to reach it from the compute host. So if you go inside the IP net NS exec this, any of these, so I'll, I pick the first one, you'll find there is a tap interface inside it. There is IP specified on this network, which is picked two in this case. And there is a MAC address is specified for it as well. So to get DHCP on this network, we need a path between the compute host and this tap interface, which is very similar to what we just did in the router. Basically, tunnel uh, VLAN IDs will get translated to VXLAN uh, tunnel IDs and then moved over to the network node. It goes up the same stream until it reaches the TAP interface, which will provide the um, DHCP address on top of it. So tunnel ID mapping happens between compute host and network node. DNS mask is the one that provides the IPs. So we've covered right now the instance to instance traffic, same network and different network, instance to DHCP agent. We have to cover the instance to public network and you trying to connect your instance over floating IPs. So an instance to public network, we all know that the VM only knows about its gateway. So we know that the traffic will end up at the router, the Q router namespace. And the Q router namespace routing table says that the default gateway is my public connection, the QG. So in this case, anything that you want to reach the public network with, it will go through the QG interface in this case, which is this one. So we have to look further of how QG interface is connected. So we know that the traffic will have to flow through this one through this part. But how is QG connected to the actual BREX bridge? What will happen is Q QG is actually a VLAN tagged interface as well, so it's tagged here one. And the QG will send traffic through the, its BREX through the patch interface. So if we go back in here, QG will get the traffic, send it down here, it goes through this way, and then exits from here. BREX does the, the normally um, stripping with a VLAN ID out. Because VLAN ID is only significant within the host. You go outside, there is no value for VLAN IDs. Sends it to a physical network. Incoming traffic will be the opposite of that. So basically, the incoming traffic will get VLAN ID such that QG gets it. So last scenario we'll talk about is the floating IPs. So, so far, we only mentioned the Q router uses only routing tables. But I mentioned first that IP tables, NAT rules are also used to implement Q, the routers in OpenStack. So the traffic would flow for inbound traffic. You're connecting over floating IP. 
go first to the public network. Public network goes to the BREX, and BREX goes up to the QG interface. Floating, if you go inside any of the Q router namespaces and do IP tables dash T, NAT dash S, so basically we're, we're looking at the NAT chain and looking what is implemented in it, you'll find lots of DNAT rules happening in here such that this public IP is translated to this um, private IP. And the same goes, so going outbound. If you connect from a VM that has a, a public floating IP associated with it, it will go outbound through its own IP. But if you connect with something that has only private IP associated with it, it will go through the, the router in this case. So now it's demo. Uh, I know I was a bit fast in it, but there was lots of material to cover. But I'll go through this demo of first outbound traffic and then the inbound traffic from a VM. So here, as you could see, there is test instance I just created has 10.0.0.16 private IP. And the traffic in order to go outbound has to go through this path to public network. This is a router that has only one interface attached to it. And this is basically where the QR interface sits. So this is a QR interface that you would expect to find inside the router namespace. And its connection to this one is a QG interface that you should expect. So basically, QR interface is implemented because of that we connected this to this, and QG interface is implemented because we connected this to that. So I'll open now the console. I have the console in here, and I'm trying to ping yahoo.com. I actually emulated a certain IP for, for it because it was I created cloud within a cloud. So now we're looking at the compute host. So we'll go to the compute host and first look at the process for the uh, KVM process. So PS-EF and GrabKVM, we see that the instance is running. Then we look at the OVS VSCTL show. So we can find here the QVO definitions for this particular VM. It has a tag for it, tag equals two, as you can see in here. And I'm TCP dumping on this interface. You can see that the ping is happening at this level. If I go back and just delete the QVO and write tap instead of it, this case, the UUID is, is the same. So if I do it, I'm right now looking at the before filtered traffic, just the, the one that exits from the, uh, the, the VM itself. So I, I have added a BR int uh, listen, which is an interface for every uh, bridge I have to listen all the traffic that goes through it. And the same I go with the tunneling bridge. So the traffic will go flow tap interface, QVO, integration bridge, tunneling bridge, and then exit out to the, till it finds its way to the network node, router, and then go outside the public network. So right now I'm, I'm TCP dumping in here, TCP ETH0, which is actually the physical interface. The reason I specify UDP because VXLAN happens over UDP. So right now I'm catching the VXLAN traffic. Uh, you see here VNI57, that's uh, basically the tunnel ID for the, um, for the VXLAN. And it's hexadecimal, I think, 39. So now we look at the network node. The network node received this traffic. So we, we look at it, TCP dump dash I, UDP. So basically, we see that the VXLAN traffic is coming from the other host, the compute host. It's same VNI, basically it's, it's unique uh, lane in the highway. And now we will go through the listeners, which those are specifically created uh, listeners on every uh, bridge. So TCP dump dash I, we can still see the pinging happening in here. We look at the integration bridge, it's happening. Next we can look into the router actually itself. So you could see here there's a QDHCP and Q router namespace. I went into the Q router namespace and let's see how what kind of interface it has. So it has a QG interface in here for its public connection, and there is a QR interface, which is the one that traffic is coming on from the compute host. I'm doing another TCP dump for it. And again, it goes now through the QG interface.
So I'm now showing the exit bridge. So basically everything has to flow through the external bridge. And I'll do a TCP dump on the physical interface attached to it, which is the ETH3. But this actually won't work. And there is a reason for that I'll explain in a sec. So as I mentioned, network namespaces isolate totally um, their network from the rest of the environment. So right now I'm inside, because I used bash to go inside the QRouter namespace, I cannot see the ETH3, which is actually outside it on the root level. So I have to exit it, and then we'll be able to do the TCP dump for the ETH3. So now I could see the traffic going out. So this is, this is basically the traffic flow for this instance. It goes from the VM, tap interface, QVB, QVO, uh, VETH pair, integration bridge, tunneling bridge, goes to the network node the same way around, exit through the QG to the BREX uh, external bridge that we have, and then goes to the public internet. So the next demo I have is Actually, for the other way around of traffic, so basically inbound traffic coming in, you using a floating IP to connect to this uh, instance. You could see in here that we have a test um, VM, 10 to 0.0.16, a floating IP, 172. And we have this topology, so traffic will have to flow first to public network, router, our network, and then reach the instance. In this case, I have a VM that's sitting on the public network. It's sharing the same IP range within, uh, with the floating IP for the VM as well. So I have the, I'll, I'll do a ping for it. So I'm pinging from the Summit 1 machine to the VM um, uh, public IP. And now we'll look at on the other way around. So we'll look at the network node. Traffic is coming in through the network node through the BREX bridge. So we'll do a TCP dump dash I ETH3. So we're seeing the traffic coming in. And do if we do IP net and S. We'll look at the router namespace. We'll go again inside it. We'll see that traffic flowing first to QG and then to QR. And from QR, it will go again through the tunneling, integration bridge, tunneling bridge to the compute host. So we see that QG is now receiving the traffic. So now it's reaching the QR interface, which represents the network the VM is connected to. And now we look at the compute host. We're receiving the traffic again on the BR tunnel. So basically it has exited the network node, going back to the tunneling bridge on the um, compute host, goes up through the integration bridge, goes up again to the tap interface, and then goes into the VM. See here the QVO interface, which is the one attached to the integration bridge. It's VLAN tag, tag equals two. Now if you look at the tab device, the tab device is getting the traffic. So that's basically it. Thank you very much for your time today. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them.